Welcome to Discovery. I hope that you've been able to enjoy these weeks leading up to Christmas. My wife and I were able to go on some walks last week, and I know that we enjoyed seeing all the Christmas decorations that people have up in our neighborhood. Last year, I ordered some Christmas decorations, but they messed up my order. I ordered some big letters so that I could put Noel on our front lawn, but they sent me the wrong letters. And if any of you know someone named Leon who might want these letters, then you can let me know and I will bring the letters over to your house. You can have them for free. It would be good if someone could make use of these letters. Last week, I started out by asking kind of a dangerous question. I asked, who would be willing to do the polar plunge in January? And I told you that I had checked on the safety of the polar plunge and someone had actually died from doing it. So the polar plunge can be dangerous, but still many people to cho choose to do it each year. So this week I have a question to ask that's even more dangerous. Here's the question. Who is willing to join me in skipping Christmas this year? Let me ask that again. Who is willing to join me in skipping Christmas this year? You know, that's a dangerous question for me to ask as a preacher because, believe me, preachers often know which messages will generate hate mail being sent to them. And this is one of those messages. Some person will stop listening right there. They'll pick up the phone. They're going to call a friend and say, can you believe what our preacher said today? He said that we should skip Christmas. I wonder if he's even a Christian anymore. Maybe he's not even an American. Everyone knows that true Christians celebrate Christmas each year. There are cards to send out and cookies to bake and a tree to decorate. Everyone knows that a true Christian puts up a Christmas tree to celebrate the birth of Jesus. We're just following what the Bible teaches us in 3 Thessalonians where it talks about having a tree to celebrate the birth of, of Jesus. You know, before you buy the stamps for your hate mail, please hear me out just a little bit longer. And if someone's looking for Third Thessalonians, you can stop them. We need to be honest. This year has been a challenging year for our nation. We've seen social unrest, terrible wildfires, hurricanes, a divisive presidential election, and COVID affecting so many things that we do. The way this year has been, it seems that skipping Christmas would just be a fitting end to a year that has been anything but normal. And you know, skipping Christmas is certainly not an original idea. In 2018, Rodney Crowell released a song called Let's Skip Christmas This Year. Here are some of the lyrics to the song and they almost sound a little bit prophetic as you listen to them now. This is what he wrote. We'll tell our family and friends that we still love them a ton, but we've just taken ill and we won't be much fun. We're contagious, we fear. Can you imagine their sneer if we skip Christmas this year? And then you have the New York Times bestselling author, John Grisham, who wrote a little book called Skipping Christmas. It was later made into a movie called Christmas with the Cranks. It starred Tim Allen as Luther and Jamie Lee Curtis as his wife, Nora. After dropping off their daughter at the airport the Sunday after Thanksgiving for a year-long Peace Corps assignment, Luther and Nora trudged back home. Nora was feeling nostalgic as she remembered all their Christmases from the past. But Luther was fuming over all the hustle and bustle and costs and demands of their annual Christmas traditions. But then he had an idea. Luther suggested to his wife that they could just skip Christmas this year and go on a cruise instead. It took a while, but his wife finally warmed up to the idea. So Mr. and Mrs. Crank have decided to skip Christmas and go on a cruise. But their neighbors get upset at their decision to not decorate their house that year because that's probably going to cost them the prize for the best decorated block in the city. 
And you know, their local charities aren't happy either. The local Boy Scout troop is upset over the Cranks refusal to purchase a Christmas tree. The police department is angry that the Cranks won't be buying a calendar from them this year. The firemen are mad that they won't be buying a fruitcake from them. And the guy who sells greeting cards, he's upset because they're not gonna place their annual order of the engraved greeting cards that they send out every year and he's gonna lose business. Poor Mr. and Mrs. Crank now have so many people mad at them over their decision to skip Christmas, and now they can't wait to get out of town. So what about you? Would you be upset at someone if they chose to skip Christmas this year? Maybe they still loved God and they still loved other people, but they simply wanted to skip Christmas this year. Would you be upset with them? Would you be upset with them if they were part of your immediate family? You know, last week I asked if you remembered which gospel writer records the genealogy of Jesus, and I hope you remembered. Matthew's other name was Levi, and if you're looking for genes, then you always look for Levi's genes. This week, let's look at the four gospels to see which ones choose to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Which gospel writers choose to celebrate Christmas. Gregory Hollifield wrote an excellent piece on celebrating Christmas, and in his writing, he came up with the idea of picturing the gospel writers living in homes next to each other, and when it's time to decorate their front lawns to celebrate Christmas, what does each gospel writer do? I wanna share some of his ideas and then mix in a few of my own. So when you look at Mark's lawn, it seems like he's either really late at putting out his decorations or he's not going to celebrate Christmas. We'll have to come back to his house later. Matthew's house is next to his on the one side. His front lawn is a Christmas wonderland. Down by the road, there's an elaborate genealogy that shows us how Jesus is a descendant of King David and Abraham. Matthew wants his presentation to show us that Jesus is a better king than David and a better teacher than Moses. When you look around his yard, you see a bewildered and confused Joseph trying to make sense of his fiancée's bizarre pregnancy and his dream with the angel. And then Matthew has several signs with Old Testament scriptures in his yard because he wants to show us that everything that was happening with the birth of Jesus was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. In Matthew 1, verse 22, it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew seems to have gone all, all out with his front lawn display. You really can't help but be impressed with everything that he has done. Now, on the other side of Mark's house, we see Luke's front lawn. And his front lawn is filled with a wide variety of characters, both well-known and unknown, rich and poor, the powerful and the powerless. At the gate is a sign that reads, For Theophilus. And just beyond is an old couple who'd given up on having kids, but now they're looking proudly into the face of their newborn son, John. There's a girl in her early teens showing the first signs of a shameful pregnancy. Further up the sidewalk, we see that same girl again on, on his lawn, but now she's ready to give birth at any moment. She's on the back of a beast being led by that same bewildered and confused man we saw over on Matthew's lawn. And under a tree that doubles as a cave, there's a nativity scene with a manger, animals, shepherds, and of course, Joseph, Mary, and her baby. Luke is really into music, so he has some loudspeakers playing some songs. They're songs that were sung by Mary, Zechariah, and this choir of angels. In Luke 2, it says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Luke's front lawn is pretty impressive in the way that he celebrates Christmas. And then you have John's house. What can you say about John's house? 
When you look at his lawn, it seems that he wants to be different from all the other lawns. John decides that he's going to go all out with the lights for his Christmas display. You know, if you've ever seen that TV commercial where the two homeowners are putting up their Christmas decorations on their lawns, then you know what I'm talking about. The one homeowner keeps saying how much he saved on his insurance, and every time he saves more money on his insurance, he adds more Christmas lights to his display. They finally cut away to an astronaut in outer space who's looking back at Earth, and he says, Houston, are you seeing this? As a gospel writer, John talks about the light shining in the darkness more than any other writer in the New Testament. When John describes Jesus coming into our world, he writes things like this in John 1, 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So John's display of light on his front lawn has attracted a lot of cars full of people who want to see this amazing light display. Meanwhile, we head back to Mark's house to look at his front lawn, and still there is nothing, just the sound of crickets. So if Mark is going to skip over talking about the birth of Jesus, then how will he start his gospel? Does anyone remember how the gospel of Mark begins? Listen to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Mark writes, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's all he says. Nothing more. And when Jesus makes his first appearance in verse 9, he's already a full-grown adult. I guess you can get the hate mail ready to send to Mark because he doesn't celebrate Christmas. I wonder if he's even a Christian. You know, Mark doesn't have anything on his front lawn about the birth of Jesus, but if you step up and look through Mark's living room window, you do see many pictures of Jesus that he has on his walls, and it seems like he has a lot of pictures that are action shots of Jesus doing ministry. Thirty-some years ago, I remember sitting in a Greek class on the Gospel of Mark, and I remember the teacher pointing out a distinctive thing about Mark's writing style. Mark loves to use the adverb immediately. Mark uses that word immediately 11 times in chapter 1. Mark finishes one story about Jesus doing ministry, and then his gospel will say, and immediately Jesus and his disciples moved on to the next thing. If Mark's gospel was a movie, then it would have to be an action movie. When you look through Mark's living room window, you see that he has pictures of Jesus doing ministry everywhere. In Mark chapter 1, we see pictures of John baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, Jesus preaching his first sermon, Jesus calling his first disciples, Jesus healing a man with an unclean spirit, Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus healing the sick and casting out demons from all the people that showed up outside the doors of Peter's house, Jesus preaching in Galilee, and Jesus healing a leper. He has pictures of Jesus everywhere, and those are just the pictures from chapter 1. It's true that Mark does not mention the birth of Jesus in his gospel, but don't make the mistake of thinking that Mark doesn't celebrate the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. It's as if Mark is saying, I'll let the other gospel writers tell you about how Jesus came. I'm going to choose to focus on why Jesus came. If we jump ahead to Mark 10, we find Jesus talking to his followers on his way to Jerusalem. And Jesus knows that he's soon going to be arrested and tried and beaten and crucified. Jesus is describing himself when he says this in Mark 10, 45. He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Holifield Hollifield comments on this verse and he says here Jesus is doing what no one before him had thought to do he's fusing the two Old Testament images of Isaiah's servant who suffers and Daniel's son of man who reigns he is teaching that Jesus came first to suffer for our sins 
but he's going to rise and take his throne later. The only way Jesus could suffer for us was to become one of us. So while Mark doesn't go into the details of how Jesus became one of us, he does spend one-third of his gospel describing how Jesus suffered for us. Mark skipped Christmas, but he didn't skip why Jesus came. If you're a part of our Discovery Church prayer chain, then you know that this past week has been a very difficult week for many families. When you think about our church family, we have family and friends who are going through a lot of heartache and challenges in their life right now. We have friends in the hospital battling COVID, and we have people grieving the loss of loved ones. We have people battling cancer, and we have people recovering from surgery. We have people battling mental illness, and we have people facing their first Christmas where a loved one will be missing from their table. Christmas can be a challenging time for so many people. In this past week, I found myself asking this question. Is there room at the manger for people who are struggling and for people who are dealing with sorrow and heartache? Let me ask that again. Is there room at the manger for people who are struggling and for people who are dealing with sorrow and heartache in their lives? You know, if you've experienced major loss in your life, then you know exactly what I'm talking about especially when it's the first Christmas after your loss. You have questions that you ask yourself. You ask, well, how should I celebrate Christmas now that I'm battling cancer? I just don't have the energy to put up a tree this year. Should I even go to my niece's Christmas program this year? When I see all those kids on stage, it's just gonna remind me of the miscarriage we had this past year. Do I even bother putting the Christmas lights up on the house this year? My wife and I always used to do that together, but now that she's gone, it just wouldn't feel right. You know, I find myself asking, is there room at the manger for people who are struggling and for people who are full of sorrow and heartache and for people who are grieving? I ran across this excellent article that Anna Kettle wrote and I wanted to share part of it with you. She said, you know, Christmas is meant to be the most wonderful time of the year, but it can throw up all kinds of mixed emotions when you're facing any kind of heartache over this festive season. Three years ago, my husband and I experienced the first of several pregnancy losses over the Christmas period. Losing a baby at any time of year is incredibly painful, but during Christmas it felt especially hard because when everyone else around us was feeling excited, we just couldn't muster up any joy. And even now, three years after that loss, the Christmas season still feels a bit bittersweet to me because the fun and festivities continue to intertwine with all those memories. So how do you cope with Christmas when it doesn't feel very merry? For a time, I honestly had no idea. And some days I just wanted to curl up and stay in bed. But it was Christmas and we had parties to attend and presents to buy and a family to host. So I just put on a brave face and put on some good makeup, a false smile, and I muddled through all the festivities as best as I knew how to. But now, I finally understand where grief and pain fit into the Christmas story. It's not something that we just have to pretend isn't there or hide it away until after the new year begins for fear of spoiling Christmas for everyone else. No, the truth is there has to be some space for not everything being okay at Christmas too. Because isn't that the whole point of the incarnation story that we celebrate? God took on flesh and entered into our world as a baby boy precisely because things were going far from okay. 
We need to make space somewhere in our Christmas customs and traditions for acknowledging our sadness as well as our joys. Wow, I really love what she wrote. How many of you can relate to what she said? In her heartache and sadness, she didn't want to spoil Christmas for everyone else, so she tried to put on a brave face, a false smile, and muddle through the Christmas festivities the best that she could. How many of you can relate to that? You know, I really don't want to be a part of a church that simply encourages everyone to slap on a fake smile and pretend that everything is okay when everything is not okay. I want to be part of a church where people can be real and authentic and honest with each other. You know that standard greeting that people employ? We say, how's it going? And you just expect a robotic reply where the other person says, it's going well, how are you doing? And we say, I'm doing good, and then we move on. Do we really give people permission to be honest with us? When we ask someone how they're doing, do we give them permission to say, I'm not okay. Cancer sucks and I hate it. Do they have permission to say that? Or will their honesty spoil the party? As we end today's message, I hope that as we plan our Christmas activities, I hope that we can make some extra space so that people can be honest and acknowledge any struggle that they might be going through. People should never feel forced to slap on a fake smile and pretend that everything is okay when everything is not okay. Let's remember that the whole reason Jesus came is because people were not okay. As we said last week, Jesus was willing to dive into our mess because he saw that we were not okay. He saw that we could not save ourselves. Jesus came to this earth and he died on the cross for our sins so that sin and suffering and death would not have the final say. That's why he came. So when you're shedding tears because someone you love has passed away, you need to know that death will not have the final say. You need to know that you're going to see your loved one again in a place where there will be no more suffering and tears. Jesus knew that we would all have struggles, and that's why he came. When your heart is troubled and you're struggling to get a good night of sleep, remember these words from Jesus in John 14, where he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That scripture reminds me that suffering and death will not have the final say. That's why Jesus came. And then a few verses later, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So as you celebrate Christmas this year, you know, I don't care if you go all out with your lights and decorations on your front lawn, and I don't care if your front lawn is bare. What I do care about is this. I want you to understand why Jesus came. Jesus came because we could not save ourselves. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. So make sure that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. He is the true hope of our world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that Jesus is the hope of the world. And Lord, I want to pray for our family here at Discovery. It's been a challenging week. And I hope, Lord, that people feel that they can be honest with each other and admit when things are not okay, when things are really hard, when things are really difficult. And Lord, it's so good to know that you came because things were not okay. 
You came to offer healing. You did not want suffering and death to have the final say. So you suffered and bled and died on the cross for our sins. You arose from the dead, conquering death. And now we do not have to fear death. We give you praise and honor and glory that we have a home in heaven where there will be no tears or suffering. So thank you for that eternal hope that we have. May all of us remember why Jesus came and may we celebrate the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.